And here's some questions and answers. Ed, I saw what you said about dealing with mosquitoes in the summertime. You use a thermocell insect repellent. What do you do in the cold weather? I, my hands get cold, I have to go inside. Yeah, me, me too, I have that issue. Those of you who know me well know I'm a serious cyclist. I ride all winter long, I have this issue too, my hands get cold. So I'll tell you what I've been doing lately. I get these heated gloves. They work off of these little batteries and they have a power setting on them and they go high, medium, and low. I really resisted this stuff for a long time, but you know what, this new generation of batteries, these are really good and they warm you up just enough so that you can do things. Now, when you're working the telescope, you're gonna to have to take these things off, but it's nice to put these things on as soon as you're done. I'll tell you, as much as I like the gloves, I like this thing even better. It's a heated vest, and there's a battery. This thing's actually pretty heavy. It slips into this pocket here, and uh, I'll tell you, this is really nice. It warms you. It feels like the sun baking on your back, and this one's got a heated collar, so if you're really cold, you kind of lean your head back. It's kind of like when you're at the barber, and they put that hot towel around your neck, and it feels really good. I think the only disadvantage about these things is the batteries take a long time to charge up somewhere between four and six hours per charge. So keep that in mind if you get these things. I'll link these below. I don't think you have to get the ones that I get. I think a lot of the sub $200 gear is pretty much the same stuff with different brand labeling and cosmetics around it. Okay, Ed, can you list the equipment that you use to make these YouTube videos? Yeah, I'll link that stuff below if you're interested, if you find that useful. I don't think my equipment is all of anything special. I find it quite modest. And I'll tell you, I spent a year watching YouTube videos about how to make YouTube videos before I started doing anything here. I thought long and hard about it. Is this something that I want to do? Are people going to find this worthwhile? And I'll tell you the two pieces of advice that come up over and over again. Number one, your audio is more important than your video. People will tolerate bad video for a while. They will not tolerate bad audio. And the most important part of your video is very often your lighting. If you have some extra money to spend, consider spending it on better lighting instead of on a fancy new camera or lens. But, you know, I'll link this stuff below if you want to take a look at it. And remember, it's about the person operating the equipment. It's not about the equipment itself. There are parallels to astronomy as well. Okay, time for a quiz. I took this picture of the moon through one of two telescopes. One of them was the Orion Space Probe three inch reflector. This green thing you see behind me, I paid $119 for it. It's either that one or the Takahashi CN212 on a CGE mount that lists for approximately $6,500 to $7,000 when it was available. Which one do you think took the picture? Answer later in the video. Ed, I've got a scratch or a broken mirror on my telescope. It really bothers me. What do I do about this? So I get this all the time. People see a scratch or they break a piece of their mirror off or their lens. There's a chip on something and they are really concerned. What I find most of the time is the damage is done mainly to your emotional state and less so to the optical quality of the telescope. Had somebody send me these pictures of something that happened to him he was cleaning his secondary mirror and it dropped. It fell right on the primary. This is a reflector. And this image here, you can kind of see at the edge where the secondary hit the primary. You'll see those little score marks there, but you can see the piece of the secondary that fell on the primary. The second image is the secondary itself. It suffered a lot more damage. You can see uh, obviously a big chunk of its torn off. You know what I told the guy? Just put it together and use it again. You'd be surprised how much damage, how much abuse these telescopes can take and still produce good images. Ed, do you have a picture you've taken recently that you're proud of? Yeah, I'll show you this one. This is a picture of the center of the Virgo cluster and Markarian's chain sort of trailing off to the left here. I took this one from the astrophysics stowaway and I was showing that to people and people started to ask me, which one's M84 and which one's M86? Those are the two bright galaxies in the center. And you know what? It kind of stumped me for a minute. I forget which one is which, so I labeled them. Then I saw that M87 was down in the lower left-hand corner there. And the next thing you knew, I had gone ahead and I, I did this. This took me about two and a half hours worth of work. This is not as easy as it looks. 
information, you know, visual information like this in photographic atlases is actually not that easy to come by. Okay, here's the answer to the quiz. I took this image of the moon through either a $119 Orion space probe 3-inch reflector, that's this green telescope behind me, or a Takahashi CN212 rig listing for approximately $6,500 to $7,000. Which one do you think took the picture? Well, it's the cheap one. It's the Orion space probe. Again, it goes back to what I was saying before. It's not the equipment, it's what you do with it. And I suspect a more skilled photographer than I could produce an image even better than that one. Ed, I saw you mention the Horsehead Nebula in Orion in a previous video. I tried to look at that and I couldn't see anything. Okay, so the Horsehead is famous in part because of its extreme difficulty. Burnham Celestial Handbook says it is, must be ranked as one of the most difficult objects in the entire sky. Because it is so hard, this only motivates some people even more to look at it. So if you're interested, I'll give you some tips to get started. First of all, I wouldn't try this thing with anything less than a 15 inch or so telescope. People have seen it in less, but for me, I'd want something in that 15 inch range. 18 or 20 is even better. The second thing you need is something called an H-beta filter. It looks like a deep sky or narrow band filter, but it's got a special bandwidth to it, for about a couple of hundred dollars. And one thing you want to know about this is it's only good for like two or three objects in the sky. And really, it's only good pretty much for the horse head. That's why you buy it. So if value is a concern for you, this thing actually represents a rather poor value. Okay. you. Still want to keep going? <laughs> All right. So the most important thing is to get the telescope out in the country away from any kind of lights whatsoever. You don't want to see any moon. You don't want to see any house lights around, no city lights. Get the thing way out in the countryside for the best possible chance to see this thing. Wait until the winter time. Look south. The constellation of Orion is quite apparent. It's a very distinctive constellation. Look at the leftmost star in Orion's belt, it's called Alnatak or Zeta Orionis. That's the good news. The bad news is it's only half a degree away from a second magnitude star in Orion. Even if you move the telescope so that the star is away, there will be some glow coming into the field of view. So if it isn't hard enough to see the horse head, the fact that that glow is there is going to make your task even harder. So let's take another look here. You can see the constellation of Orion and where the arrow is pointing. You could see that sort of red line going down from Alnatak. The horse head is actually in that red line. And if you look very carefully, I don't know what your monitor is doing or what YouTube compression is doing to this video, but there's a little black sort of knob or sort of little black speck that is about halfway down that red line. That is the horse head. That is your target. So here's a picture I took through the Astrophysics Riccardi Honders. That's a special astrograph. And you can see Alnatak very shining very brightly on the left there. You'll see that red line going down. It's actually purple in this picture and the horse head in the middle. So let's go ahead and crop this and simulate moving Alnatak out of the field of view. Now, of course, in many deep sky objects, you can't see color. It's very difficult for the human eye to perceive color at low light levels. So let's go ahead and make this black and white. And again, of course, this is a long exposure photograph. So we're going to have to dim this quite a bit. This is somewhat brighter than you're going to see it through a telescope. So I'm going to take this down even more. And now we're going to get into an area where I don't know how your monitor or your screen is calibrated. You may see nothing but a black field of view. And in fact, most of the time when you look at the horse head, this is what you see. But if your monitor can display this, you can see a very slight outline of the horse head against the background. And this is still probably a little bit better than you're going to see it live. The thing that I describe to people to see when they're looking for the horse head is you're going to see a black field of view with nothing there, except that the center is slightly blacker than the black around it. And if you can perceive that, that is usually considered an acceptable sighting of the horse head nebula. So I know people who organize 
Horsehead parties. In the wintertime, they wait for a really clear moonless night, and they'll call up the friends and they'll say, let's all go out and try to find the horsehead. They do this knowing that they're probably going to fail. In fact, most people viewing this, most of us will never see the horsehead in our lifetimes. I've seen it once through a 24-inch reflector. You know what? It doesn't matter. It's all about getting out there, being with your friends, trying to learn something, and above all, having fun. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.